Hi, my name is Nigel Kivis work for RBM and Advanced Technology Support in Europe. This is part three of this series of N1 Advanced Topics. We're now at number four, N1 External Data Collectors. A couple of times a year I get emails that run along the similar sort of lines as I have here. I want you to change Engmon so that it collects the new memory stat from uh, Linux. Uh, it's obviously vital, it must be a mistake that it's not already collected, so let me know when you fix this. And I look at this particular memory stat, for example, and I have no idea what the stat means. If there's any documentation, it may be in very vague terms and I don't really know. I don't even know if a big number is good or a small number is good. And if it's the wrong sort of number, I don't know what I can do about it. So I keep thinking, well, no, I'm not going to change Nmon. It could break a lot of uh, tools that take the Nmon format data, and it's not really worth it if it's not a really important stat that we understand what it means. So I say, no, I'm not adding that. Please use an Nmon external data collector to add this to your files. Now there is a, an excellent uh, blog on the AXPERT blog. Now unfortunately when I'm writing this uh, video, the AXPERT blog is on developer works and that may change in the next six or seven weeks. So good luck finding the AXPERT blog. It will be out there somewhere. Now here are the basics then. You s set some shell variables before you actually run Nmon. So there's one called Nmon start and this is the name of a command or a script that you want to run. So when Nmon starts up, it will call this script. That script has to do something. So it has to output the column titles. A simple shell script with an echo will do this fine. And it needs to save those titles into a different file. Then the next one is called Nmon snap. So every time we do a snapshot, Nmon will call this command or script. It needs to generate the data somewhere. You're getting this from, maybe it's from a database, for example, or maybe it's from an application looking at transactions complete or whatever it is. Then it has to reformat that data into Nmon style. It is actually past the, that timestamp number, you know, the T0001, T002. It's past that for the current snap, and um, so you can add that to the output. And I'll need to append that to the same file as the Nmon start. Optionally, there's one for Nmon end. Maybe you're creating some temporary files and you want to clean those up, so you could have that one there as well. Then at the end of the run of collecting Nmon data, you now have this other file that's in Nmon format. So you append it to the end of the Nmon file, and if you're using the analyzer, very spookily, it will say, whoa, there's some new data here, and it'll actually graph it for you. And if the numbers in there, if you've only got one number, that's fine. But if you've got several numbers, if they're of the same sort of number, if they're all percentages, then they're in the same range. There's not some that are in percentages and some which are, I don't know, memory pages, which are up in the millions. Um, but if that's not the case, then you'll get a very nice graph instantaneously. For the other tools, you will have to add it as a new graph, perhaps to Nmon chart, for example, or other tools. So let's give you a worked example. So here we've got a little program called pstart, and this is all it has in it. It does a echo of that string and starts a file called uh, ps dot comma separate values. The p snap then is a little bit more complicated actually doing something so it's going to it's going to output something into the file and not finish the line and then it's going to run the ps minus ef command come out the number of processes and then add that to the file. So we have some string and then we have the number. Before we start nmon we have to set these two shell variables. We run nmon and once complete, we get what's on the next slide. What we'll actually see in the file then is that a title line like this, the number of processes. This is actually being the name of the graph and the processes. And then these are the stats. This T number is passed to it as when it calls that shell script. So here we go. If you're using the analyzer, it will actually generate your graph straight off the bat. Um, other tools, you will have to actually make changes to them to actually get that data. Okay, now at number six, we're looking at uh, Nmon is for performance tuning. Remember, I wrote Nmon for benchmarking, where we run a benchmark, we look at is there a tuning opportunity here? Perhaps we can use more memory, so we have some free to do more disk caching, which means we don't have to wait so long when we actually ask the data from the disks because they're less busy and we don't have to run device drivers so that actually frees up a bit more CPU that makes us go faster. But if we're doing capacity planning it's a very different ball game. 
instead of capturing data every couple of seconds to a minute or so capacity planning is much slower level so they don't want so much data 15 minute stats is probably a bit fast actually for capacity planning you'll get 96 of those every day I quite often get uh, asked from uh, systems administrators I've suddenly been asked to merge 31 daily Enmon files to make monthly reports for my manager and the analyzer is causing all sorts of problems please respond immediately I need to get this report done by my manager first thing you have to remember that perhaps you're thinking the wrong way and making some sort of classic bad thinking in here remember if you've got 31 days worth of files but your graph can only be well if you're on a big screen it's 1600 maybe you got to 1900 so you've got a real big 32 inch screen but how many data points are you trying to display on that 1600 pixels you have a serious problem because if you're capturing data once a minute and some people go a lot faster than that then in a month you have 44,000 minutes in a month and so if you count the number of pixels you're actually trying to put 30 data points per pixel this isn't going to work you can't do that a single pixel out of here can't represent 30 data points you have too much data and this is why your tools are probably exploding this is one of the major differences between performance tuning and capacity planning this data management problem is exactly what we fix with NJMOD. We'll come back to that later on. Now, I'm not sure if you noticed that I missed that number five, and here it comes. It's better to take this in this order. There's an nmon merge command that you can run. This merges two files together. This is particularly useful if, for example, you've had to reboot an LPAR or virtual machine during the day. Then you might have an nmon output file for the first half of the day and then the second half of the day and you really want the day's worth to match all your other records that are by the day so we can go to the SourceForge website down here we've got uh, nmon merge and you can join files together but this won't work wholesale so when you're trying to do the 31 days to do a monthly report you'll add all the data together and it will run out of uh, space when you try to get that graphed so at least you'll understand why now and number seven, Microsoft Excel is not compatible with Microsoft Excel. Microsoft tends to update Excel every couple of years, and when they do that, it's not compatible with the previous version. There's something wrong with the macros involved or the Visual Basic that is programmed in, and it seems like every blue in time, a user will upgrade their copy of Excel. Now they find the analyzer crashes, and it's the Enman analyzer that's fault. Well, it's not really. It's Microsoft have botched it up. You'll actually throw the user into debug mode, and they'll usually go, what the heck's this? I don't know what to do now, and they report it to me. Especially true if you're running an Apple Mac. Now, I have to confess, I am not the analyzer guy. I wrote the Enmon, and the Enmon Analyzer was originally written by Steve Atkins, who's retired right now, and it's now maintained by Ron McCarga. It's not his day job, he does that because he actually wants it to do analysis of the virtual I.O. server, which is supporting his favorite operating system, which is IBM I. This means we have to make changes in the analyzer probably with every new update of Excel. Well, you'll just have to give us the time to do that, but it's not our fault, really. By the way, the port of the analyzer to OpenOffice or LibreOffice or similar sort of programs like that uh, has been attempted and aborted twice. We find that the language in which you write the macros is too slow by about an order of magnitude. What would take a minute now takes 10 minutes or something. And that's partly why we have Nmon chart. Number eight. This is for AX only, nothing to do with Linux. In my humble opinion, these PCPU and SCPU stats were added to AIX at a particular technology level and it was a mistake that is now corrected. But for two years there are Enmon versions in those versions of AIX that generate extra stats for the physical CPU use and the scale CPU use. These numbers of stats are very, very high, especially particularly if you're on uh, big machines. If you're on a, a great big E880 or 980, it could be producing 1,500 extra lines of stats that probably you don't want. It's only if we got 
the um, processor in a mode where it can vary the frequency over time, does that actually add any value? We can actually just strip out that data using uh, two grip commands, so you do that if you'd like. That means um, you'll have better luck with the analyzer and the other tools if you just strip them all out, because they can literally double the size of the NMON file. In newer versions of NMON, you don't find these, but you can switch them on if you really want. You have to add to the NMON command this particular syntax, in my humble opinion. Boy, is that ugly, but there we go. That's what we got. Now this time it's for Linux. So NMON for Linux, the CPU utilization stats. Now for decades, Unix, and I'm talking real Unix, not Linux. Linux is a bit like the real thing called Unix, and AIX is a Unix operating system. But we've had four utilization percentages, and we're pretty sure we understand what we're doing here. User system, wait, and idle. Now, of course, the user time is the way the kernel processor guys think of a, an application running that's running the user side code. System is the kernel, and we only get to get into the kernel of the Unix operating system in one of two ways. One is the we're in user mode running an application and it makes a system call because it wants the system to actually do something like uh, get a disk record or push a packet out onto the network. And then we have wait for IO and idle. Now those two are actually the same thing. They're both, when we're in that mode, we're sitting in an idle loop with nothing to do. That's an opportunity for your benchmarker to change things and, and get you, find you some work to actually do to improve the performance. There's a subtle difference between the wait and the idle. When we go into idle mode, if there's a disk I.O. outstanding, the little flag is set and that's called wait for I.O. Um, otherwise it's called idle, but they're both waiting in the idle loop. The idea being is that it's an indication that we could do more work if the disks were faster, because in the good old days that was nearly the, always the thing that was holding back your computer. In more modern uh, Unixes, there is a flag per CPU, so it looks at its own flag when one particular CPU goes into the idle loop, so you don't get um, 15 CPUs all in wait for I.O. because one of them did an I.O. Now this is, or it was true for Linux, uh, not true any longer. We've now uh, got a whole bunch more of utilization stats for Linux, and I want you to know, now shout at the screen how many you think we have in Linux because it was a bit of a shock to me. And the answer is we now have 10 utilization stats for Linux. You can see the user system idle and wait is there, the original ones as we would expect them to be, but there's a whole bunch more. So let's quickly go through these. We have the nice value here which is user mode but with a lower priority. Now you get the nice because there's a nice command. If you say nice and then run a command, it runs that job at a lower priority. In my humble experience, I've never seen anybody use that. Maybe Linus uses the nice command to do a background compile of the kernel while he goes off and reads his email or something, so he drops the priority of it. But nobody else on the planet does that, so that's uh, not very useful in my humble opinion. Next we have the hardware and uh, interrupt and the software interrupt. Now, when we're in system mode, that's inside the kernel, then there's two ways of getting there. One is we've made a system call from user programs or applications asking the system to do something for you, get us some information or read or write data to networks and disks and those sorts of operations. Um, the other way we get into the system, the kernel time, is because we've had a hardware interrupt coming back from an, uh, an adapter saying, I've got some data for you, come and get it, and so I can get on with the next piece of work for you. But these have been split out now, so we actually see the, the hardware interrupts and the software interrupts. There are, are some software interrupt uh, mechanisms that you have so that processes can communicate with each other, for example. So those are split out. I guess that's okay. I could do with that. Skip steal, because that's really complicated. Then we have that uh, guest time. Now, if you're familiar with virtual machines, perhaps KVM uh, type operating, then if we're using 
Enmon in the hosting, the operating system, then when we're running the virtual machines, that's known as a guest percentage. Which is a nice, nice stat, so you can see how much time the virtual machines are actually occupying the percentage of the CPU. And the guests could be running in uh, nice mode as well. So that's the same as the user nice up in here. I doubt if we'll ever see any of that. I should point out that these guests, the virtual machines, they are operating as processes in the Unix kernel. They are scheduled in the same sort of way as Unix processes. The, their priority goes up and down. They have a um, number of CPUs they can spread out across to actually operate on, and you can oversubscribe the number of uh, virtual CPUs on the physical CPUs um, so you can sweat the machine. Now, the steal time is... Uh, when your virtual machine is running, um, you said it can use, say, eight CPUs, but it's not getting eight CPUs with the time when it wants it. So maybe it's only getting a lower fraction of that. Maybe it's only getting four CPUs because there's so many other virtual machines trying to maximize their time on each of your CPUs. So if you like, this is time stolen from a virtual machine because other virtual machines have, have taken that time away from it. So this would appear if you're actually monitoring using Enmon in a virtual machine inside KVM. Interesting to have a lot more stats. Some of it's useful, some of it uh, maybe not so. So when you're actually running uh, Enmon, if you're doing it online, you type a U, or if you're collecting it to a file, use the uh, uh, minus this is uppercase U in both cases. This is what it looks like on the screen. I could do with a better uh, Snapshot of this on a machine that's actually doing a lot more work So we can see some user time in here for the CPUs and we can see some system time. That's quite high I'm not quite sure what I'm doing in here probably a simple looping program uh, quite a lot of idle time in here You can see this is slightly over. This is of inaccuracies in uh, the Unix kernel in monitoring things and we see there's no values down in here. Maybe I'll have to try and get some uh, VMs running hard and then find some guest time appearing down in here. Quite useful stats. Uh, now you know that you can switch that on with Enmon or Linux and work out a lot more about what's happening in your computer, uh, particularly if you're a guest operating system or if you're a hosting operating system. And that's the end of this video. You can see we've gone from topic four to topic nine. Topic 10 is in part four. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this movie and learned something. That gives us the ammunition to carry on with more videos. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to be told when part four arrives.